Mitzvah's Vide Tshuva, the Mitzvah of Confession and Tshuva. So much we have learned so far. We have learned specifically that the Mitzvah of Confession is its own Mitzvah. It is not specifically contingent on their sacrifices, the base of Mikdash, anything like that. Verbalizing and saying to recognize that I have done this and this wrong is a positive Mitzvah for someone to do. When you verbalize, you reinforce your resolve not to do it again. And when you verbalize, you acknowledge that God sees everything. All to say that the Mitzvah of Tshuva, how does it work, especially if you're going to process the process correctly? First, we must resolve, I will never do this again. We call it Ziva Sachet. It must be accompanied by Harata, deep remorse and regret. Then comes Vidu, the confession. I articulate what I did wrong. And once we have done all that thoroughly and in the correct manner, now, Bakash Mechila, now we ask for forgiveness. And when this is all done in the correct manner, then the forgiveness comes and it wipes away, as we've seen the verse, it wipes away the sin like the cloud. Please God, amen, so may it be. If a person transgresses, their action creates something, an entity. Pleasure satisfaction that is felt at the moment of the transgression creates a soul, an enlivening aspect to this entity. To process the process correctly and not only take out half the tick, we want both of those to go away. Because we saw different examples about how the sin, the body of the entity that's created will hover around a person, it will cause problems for them, etc., etc. We want this all to entirely go away. So action undoes action, emotion undoes emotion, which is why harata, the regret, the remorse, all that is so important to undo the pleasure, the satisfaction. And then action, in theory, we'd have to relive the situation, but God in his great kindness to us allows for the verbalization, which is the confession, this is action enough to undo the body that's created through an action. Which, by the way, as another aspect of that's part of why prayer is supposed to be articulated. You're supposed to verbalize prayer. Even if you just kind of whisper it to yourself, but you are supposed to verbalize prayer. We want an action in this world that affects the world, that refines the world. Now, to understand fully what's going on here, we have to see how does the system work? What is the spiritual ecological system at play here that we could disrupt the system and how to repair the system? So the mitzvahs are called mitzvah sabaya. They're connected to the name of avaya. This name of avaya is connected to the 10 attributes. We saw different letters represent different attributes. Doing the mitzvah draws down God's infilite into the structure of the 10 attributes, draws it all the way down here till eventually it moves through creation and gets into our world where it enlivens, it nourishes, it gets the energy that keeps this world going. And for this, the whole world was created. So if, God forbid, a person does what they're not supposed to do, they puncture it, it's a bleeding wound. That energy has to go somewhere, it doesn't just dissipate. Where does that energy go? The negative forces can now glean onto it, they can now latch onto it, because usually they're kept on not life support, basically. And here they feed off of this. So when we want to undo this sin, it's not just because personally I don't want this stuff hovering around me and causing problems for me, but also I need a full realignment because I don't want these negative forces to exist anymore to be leeching off of the divine light that should be energizing the world. We also see about how if a person transgresses, the divine spark is like an exile, it's taking the king's head and shoving it in a privy full of filth. All this not good stuff, which leads us to the point of showing how tshuva is so powerful, it's a healing agent. It will sanitize, sterilize the wound, it will stem the bleeding, it will heal it, and it'll make it like it was never there. So there's not even a scar or anything left. That is how powerful tshuva is. And we see the verse, Kia mitzvah zos, Asher mitzvah rechoki, this mitzvah, which I have commanded to you, it's not hidden from you and it's not far off from you. Originally, we see that in the book of Devarim, it's part of Moshe's last will and testament to the people. But here, we've seen from commentary relating it to something higher than that, this mitzvah is the mitzvah of tshuva. It wasn't mean it's not hidden from you and it's not far off from you, because what do we tap into in the mitzvah of tshuva? Because we're operating on the level of mitzvah sabaya, that is not the level that we could fix it at. We need to go up to a higher level to be able to fix it. We have to go to where the source of these things are. We have to go to the materials to be able to fix it. Because where we operate is where the puncture occurred. So where do we go to? That's where we get the verse of Anoche, Anoche, Humoche, Peshecha, Manmacha, Tosecha, Lo Eskar, ISI, and he who erases your transgressions. Why do we see the name Anochi Anochi, I, I, I-S-I, is used twice because it's talking about two levels of the level of Keser. Keter, which is a crown, so it's above the intellect because we have to go higher. We have to go higher than the 10 attributes. So it's like the crown above the 10 attributes. What is in the level of Keser? These two levels that we call Atik Yemen and Arch Anpin. Atik Yemen, which is delight, and Arch Anpin, which is will. Because ultimately, these two primary overriding factors dictate everything else. God decided he would delight in the world. He thereby wanted the world and thereby he had the world. For God, it's all an instantaneous process. For us, there's a process for us. What causes me pleasure? Thereby I want it, and thereby I'm going to go after it. What causes me pleasure? What's going to delight me? And what I want, those operate on a level above the intellect, which is why they're inexplicable. As soon as, as I can start explaining it, we're not necessarily at that level anymore. We've drawn it down. That is the level, however, that we have to reach to go and bring the healing about. Now, it seems that optic, which is removed from the days, it's removed from the aspects of creation because it's the lowest aspect of the emanator. What a wondrous level is this? It should be hidden from us because it's so high. And this level of Arach Anpin, which is the source of the emanations, the fountainhead of creation, creation, the watershed of creation. This is the starting point of everything. That also should seem so far away from us. It's past the Sea of Chachmet. And yet, we say, Kia mitzvah, this mitzvah is not far away from you because teshuva and all that it can do is actually very close and accessible to you. What does it do? When we have Atik, this lowest point of the emanator, the delight, etc. Because it's such a high level, it's a bright and brilliant light that can't be taken in. So if we draw that light down, that's going to help sterilize the wound in the sense that the negative forces, it can't absorb it, so it runs away. Say so if you try to stare into the sun, you can't. Your eyes close. You can't stare into the sun. These negative forces 
because they can't handle this light. So now we've gotten them all to go away. We're cutting off their nurture. We're cutting off what they're leeching off of. Once we cut them off, we can actually get rid of them. And where do you get rid of them from? This love of Arach Anpin will be able to come in to remedy and to undo what was done. Part of the process, processing correctly, doing tshuva correctly means all of this can happen as it's supposed to. And then we also saw about how tshuva, it's tash of hay, we're, we're returning the hay of this divine name and how to do it through deep contemplation, understanding who have you sinned against. Emphasis is on God. And through that, we're going to reach into the deepest recesses of our soul, of ourselves, and reawaken our commitment and love for God, etc., to actually be able to reach this new level. Ultimately, we get to a level that's even higher than Kesa, and that's the level of Adam Kadmon, primeval man. That is where all of creation is realized in one go, as in the whole completion of creation is all seen there. It's the full vision of everything. So drawing down from there is the panacea level. It's even a higher panacea level than Kesa would be. Because ultimately, that's where we come from. Ultimately, that is where we could draw down from when we do everything as we're supposed to. And that brought us to this idea that we see in the Shemona Esri, the Amida prayer, where we say, Salah lana vinu kichatanu, forgive us our father for we sin. That's not a reason for forgiveness. Oh, forgive us father for we sin. Yes, that's why you should be asking forgiveness. That's not a reason why you should forgive you. That only happens when we see what comes first. Achazirenu, the shuva shalei melefenecha, return us a complete shuva. When we draw closer to you through complete shuva, how did that complete shuva come about that drew us closer to you? That came about because we sinned. So now please forgive us. Now that we've reached this higher level, please forgive us. And that's how these verses work. This leads us to the idea of how is it that about shuva someone who does teshuva, does the process correctly, they now reach a level that even a tzaddik can't be at. And why is that? Because the tzaddik is operating on the standard level, the level of the mitzvah savaya. In perfection, in the ultimate way, he's operating there, but that is where the tzaddik is operating at, this level of mitzvah savaya. Because the bal tshuva, at one point, was a transgressor, they went and they started meddling in stuff that they shouldn't have been meddling in. They went into the forbidden stuff. Why is it forbidden? Because it's stuff that we can't elevate. And yet he went there. But because he went there, and he finally woke up and realized what he was doing. And that then was the impetus, the inspiration, the push to embark on the tshuva process, thereby drawing closer to God. That negative action now becomes a merit to him because that drew him closer to God. That brings him to a level where the tzaddik can't be because the tzaddik doesn't go metal and that kind of stuff. He's just operating at the regular level of mitzvah sabaya, but we saw right at tshuva brings us to a level above that because that is the level we could repair at. That means though that the person who's doing tshuva is reaching that level that is a level higher than where the tzaddik is operating at when he fulfills the mitzvah. We saw examples of that like the kings of Edom, they rose, they fell, they rose, they fell. Things about the two worlds of toe, different details about that. We saw also the idea about Shuva being a healing agent. Medicine, you only need a little bit of medicine and it does way more than what large quantities of regular food would do for you. There's a very powerful agent at work here that God allows to be at work here. The word of God in it is much stronger. It's more compact higher energy. Teshuva works like medicine. All the regular mitzvahs are the regular eating and functioning that we're supposed to be doing, which is the way it's supposed to be. But if, God forbid, someone becomes sick, which is in theory an anomaly in the sense that this is now not us being naturally healthy, someone becomes sick, they need something that's even stronger to make them well again. And that's where you go to the medicine. The medicine is not good for the healthy person. The medicine is what's needed for the sick person. So teshuva is like the medicine for the sick person, which is that extra strong boost to make them healthy again, etc, etc. And this brings us to where we ended off last time. All of this that we're saying about teshuva, and it's one qualities, like the levels that we reach, this is only possible in this world. This capacity that we have for tshuva, we can only reach it here. Now we're going to start seeing examples about the power of tshuva in this world. And not just tshuva is a healing agent, and when one person does tshuva, God forgives the whole world and things like that. Here we're seeing it in a very specific thing, in the medicine kind of format. That one little drop is so powerful that see what it effectuates. This is from the Gemara, from the Tractate of Kedushin. It's talking about if a man betrothes a woman, is this a valid betrothal? And it gives different scenarios for it. If a person says, oh, marry me on the condition of whatever, does that hold? So here it brings it in. If one says to a woman, be betrothed to me on the condition that I'm a righteous man, that I'm a tzaddik, then even if he was a completely wicked man, she is betrothed. This is considered a valid betrothal. What? The person says, oh, marry me on the condition that I'm a tzaddik. Everyone's like, that person is totally not a tzaddik. But if he says it and she agrees, they are considered betrothed. It's a valid halachic status. As perhaps in the meantime, he had thoughts of repentance in his mind and is not righteous. As in, even if there was in that brief amount of time, he actually thought to himself, oh, I'm going to be better. Whether or not he goes back to his previous behaviors, Shuva is so powerful that if he had that thought in mind in that moment, it's enough. Yeah, you have to understand how powerful Shuva is. Now, we already saw from the levels that we reached, but now we're seeing it in practical application. Here's another one. We've heard this story before. Now you can see how it's spoken about in the Gemara. So this is from the tractate of Avodah Zarah. The Gemara asks, And is it correct that one who repents of the sin of forbidden intercourse does not die? But isn't it taught in Brita, in a previous teaching, they said about Rabbi Elazar ben Derdaya that he was so promiscuous that he did not leave one prostitute in the world with whom he did not have intercourse with. We have spoken of him before, Rabbi Elazar ben Derdaya. He knew every red light district and then some. And it's interesting. First of all, we're calling him Rabbi Elazar ben Derdaya. It's interesting. How did we get here? Everything is in the Gemara 
Gemara, guys. You don't even know. But it, you're going to see again the power of tshuva. It's so important. Once he heard that there was one prostitute in one of the cities overseas who would take a purse full of dinars as her payment. He's like, oh, I haven't met her yet. He took a purse full of dinars and went across seven rivers to reach her. He was very intent on making sure that his record, he wanted 100% body count. When they were engaged in the matters to which they were custom, which is a euphemism for intercourse, she passed when and said, just as this past wind will not return to his place, which also, I don't, I'm not sure what that means. The Hebrew doesn't clarify it more. Yeah, I don't know. So too, Elazar ben Derdaya will not be accepted in repentance, even if we were tried to repent. So she was saying that just as this is something that can never be taken back, Elazar ben Derdaya, you are so sinful, you can never come back from this path that you were on. This statement deeply shocked Elazar ben Derdaya. Now remember, he wasn't looking for tshuva. It wasn't like, no, all of a sudden he's like, you know what, I've really gone astray. This is something that happened that she just said it, and all of a sudden it impacted him so strongly that it was, oh my God, I think I need to reassess. And he went and sat between two mountains and hills and said, mountains and hills, pray for mercy on my behalf so that my repentance will be accepted. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf. As it is stated, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed. There's a lot of verses from Isaiah of Isaiah. He said, heaven and earth, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf. As it is stated, for the heaven shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment. He said, sun and moon, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf. As it is stated, then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. He said, stars and constellations, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf, as it is stated, and all the hosts of heaven shall molder away. These are all verses from Yeshaya. I've heard before, I think it's from Rabbi Gordon. I, I heard before that someone was saying that it's not just him calling upon the different aspects of nature to pray for him. It was also, you can see it as him blaming everything else. Oh, I'm this way because of my upbringing. I'm this way because of nature, nurture, whatever it is. Eventually we get to, Elazar ben said, clearly the matter depends on nothing other than myself. He placed his head between his knees and cried loudly until his soul left his body. He prayed to the point of death, basically. A divine voice emerged and said, Rabbi Elazar ben Derdaya is destined for life in the world to come. The Gemara explains the difficulty presented by the story. And here Elazar ben Derdaya was guilty of the sin of forbidden intercourse, and yet he died once he repented. The Gemara answers, there too, since he was attached so strongly to the sin, to an extent that transcended the physical temptation he felt, it is similar to heresy, as it had become like a form of idol worship for him. They're saying he died once he repented. We're talking about forbidden intercourse. He didn't have to die from sleeping with all the prostitutes. But here it says, no, for him, because it had become such an idol for him, basically, this was part of his repentance. Once he achieved repentance, he passed away. So when Rabbi Yehuda Anasi heard the story of Elazar ben Derdaya, he wept and said, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, the great Judah prince, he redacted the Mishnah, great, great sage and leader of the Jewish people. When Rabbi Yehuda Anasi heard the story of Elazar ben Derdaya, he wept and said, there is one who requires his share in the world to come only after many years of toil. There's one who requires his share in the world to come in one moment. And Rabbi Yehuda Anasi further says, not only are penitents accepted, but they're even called rabbi. That's the divine voice referred to Elazar ben Derdaya as Rabbi Elazar ben Derdaya. This person who was Elazar ben Derdaya, he was not looking for tshuva. But all of a sudden, this one prostitute said something to him that woke him up. It shook him. It shook him so strongly that first he tried to blame everything else. He tried to call upon everything else. I'm like, sorry, we can't help you. He said, obviously, I can only help myself. His repentance was so complete to the point, he basically died from it. But he had achieved full repentance at that point. And the voice that comes out doesn't just say, oh, you Elazar, you'll be fine. It says, Rabbi Elazar. Bender Daya, you get the world to come. So Rabbi Huda Nasi is saying, this person achieved it in one moment, one hour, he achieved it. Look what his entire life was. And yet, at this point, his teshuva was so properly done, his teshuva was at such a level that he was able to basically wipe the slate clean. He was able to actually achieve the world to come. And not just that, he's called Rabbi Elazar Bender Daya to show his fully elevated status that he had achieved. We're bringing in this example, which is actually one of the prime examples of teshuva, to show you how powerful is teshuva. It is so powerful that even if you're not looking for it, and even if this is what it takes, and even what it gets to, it can wipe everything clean. Person doesn't have to do tshuva to the point of dying. For him, it became like a, a type of idolatry for him to sleep with everybody. Such is the radical, instantaneous power of tshuva in this world. You see two examples of how powerful tshuva is. In the world to come, however, although a soul continuously advances, it cannot radically change its spiritual standing as in this world. In the world to come, we say, oh, the neshama should have an aliyah. It means that it should go up level to level. It should rise in its levels of spirituality, levels of holiness. It should keep going up. But that's just reaching new levels, but not a radical 180. It's not a, a radical change that it undergoes. Here, a person could literally go from a sinner to a righteous person in an instant with a full, complete shuva. They could fully change themselves. In the world to come, it's not like that. Whatever kind of spiritual state the neshama gets to from the cleansing, it just rises within that level. In this world, we could have an absolute change, radical absolute change. Verses to substantiate this. This is from Tractate Shabbos. He resolved the contradictions in this manner. This is not difficult. That which David said, as a King David said, the dead do not praise the Lord. It's actually said in Hallel. This is what he is saying. A person should always engage in Torah mitzvot before he dies. As once he is dead, he is idle from Torah mitzvot and there is no praise for the Holy One, blessed be he from him. A soul and a body can do Torah mitzvot. A soul without a body cannot do Torah mitzvot. So it rises within levels of holiness in the sense that it will experience great revelations, but it can't do Torah and can't do mitzvot. Near it's saying, do it before a person passes away. Well, a person doesn't know the day of their death. So we should be in a continual state of always trying 
trying to do Torah and mitzvot, also constant keep teshuva, a full awareness of teshuva. And that is what Rabbi Yochanan said, what is the meaning of that which is written, set free among the dead? Like the slain that lie in the grave, who be remember no more. From Tilim, the Mesim Chofshi. When a person dies, he becomes free of Torah mitzvot. What does it mean a person becomes free of Torah mitzvot? Because a soul in a body is not obligated in Torah mitzvot. It's the soul in the body, in the physical world, that is Torah mitzvot. We've spoken about it before in the sense of this is how powerful our mission here is in this world, and that's why we want to do action oriented mitzvot. And a Rosh and a Tzaddik, they can do the same mitzvah. The Lulav and Esther is the same for everybody. A Tzaddik might experience it differently, but we're all doing the same mitzvah. The words of prayer are the same for everybody. A Tzaddik might experience it differently, but the verbalization of the words is the same words that everyone's saying. Here we have from Kohelet, then we'll see how the Zohar refers back to Kohelet. Whatever your hand attains to do, as long as you are with your strength, do, for there is neither deed nor reckoning, neither knowledge nor wisdom in the grave where you are going. Everyone has a certain time frame within this world. But if you remember all the way back to the first mark we did, Kol Mach Brecha, that people are like hired workers. We only have a set amount of time to get stuff done. So here Kohelet is urging, get it done, because there's your only chance to get it done. The Zohar says, a person should not say, when I come to that world, as in the world to come, then I'll ask for mercy from the king, capital K, and repent before him. There is no action, etc., in the grave. We just saw the verse from Kohelet. Rather, he should strive in this world. For after when he departs from this world, he is judged with severe judgment, the judgment of Gehenna. In that realm, there is no counsel or wisdom or understanding to save him from judgment. The world to come, which we're going to see, is a black and white world, in the sense that there's clarity in that world. Where there needs to be judgment, where there needs to be retribution, so it is. In this world, because this world is a less clear world, it's more malleable. We have more opportunity and potential for changing in this world versus the world to come. So after passing, after a person passes away, Teshuva does not help one who is wicked. Rather, he receives judgment and appropriate punishment. Kavakela, Chibotekever, Gehenim. Kavakela is the slingshot thing. Remember, a person is in a world of activity. They have to relive their frivolity in the world of truth. So you have to kind of relive the foolishness with the knowledge of this is so foolish, which is a very painful situation to like, why am I doing this right now? But you have to relive the whole thing to understand how foolish it was. Chibotekever, which is called turning over the grave. And Gehenim, which we know is not hell but more like purgatory the cleansing we want to make chuva happen here because here is where we can do the cleansing in the world to come it's well time for the process to start a purification process according to sins until he merits gan Eden. so eventually a person will be cleansed in the world to come before they go to gan Eden. but it's very painful very very painful for the soul here's where we get stuff done both in terms of doing chuva and in terms of doing the torah and the mitzvah in this world however one proper thought of teshuva at the heart absolves all punishment and acquires a share in the higher world where he delights in hashem in abundance of good as we saw from these examples of people who seem to be such not good people and yet all it requires is one complete whole thought of tshuva it can already change a person's status it can already elevate cleanse the person because that is how powerful tshuva is the same thing as the medicine just a little drop of medicine it's so powerful you only need a little bit to heal that is how powerful tshuva is and it's specifically for this world versus the world to come where everything is set and complete and there's no changes in the world to come so let's not waste our time here we should live in the recognition to seize the chance to do the mitzvot to pursue the chance to study Torah and to do the mitzvot and also to make sure to be in a state of tshuva as in always trying to draw closer to God.